thanks for joining us. Do you want to just start off and tell us a little bit about like where you grew up and what your childhood was like? Yeah, so I'm originally, I'm, my family is Norwegian. Um, I live in uh, Sweden at the moment, but I grew up in Norway and I was actually born in France, uh, in Paris back in the day, but moved to Norway and, um, and just, you know, small time kid, uh, small town kid just growing up. Um, but I had a lot of interest in, uh, in sports and, and bikes and racing. So that was kind of my, that was kind of my jam, uh, growing up. So I was really active, uh, as a kid and kind of sought that environment um even though it was like a small town you know it's really like tight-knitted community so you know racing bikes became you know more than a hobby it became you know i guess like a real passion and and just kind of like gave my it was like a window to life basically so um so that was kind of my upbringing it was very active and just kind of being outdoors and uh, and just uh, you know going to races with friends and, and kind of just like living i guess like that type of lifestyle early on as a kid. Cool. And how did you like get into filmmaking early on? Like, did you just pick up a camera and to start filming some of your bike races or like, how did that start? I, I grew up, I would say kind of in the heyday of, of like action sports and, and sports videos, films to be more precise. And, uh, and this is, you know, pre streaming, pre YouTube, everything's VHS. If you dig, you know, if you go, back for far enough, uh, but DVDs basically. So it became, you know, the, you know, growing up, listening to music and getting that one record, you know, you see a film, bike film or skate film or snowboard film or anything you get your hands on. And that was kind of, you know, the eye opening experience, especially when you're a kid, because you had so many different impressions, um, you know, style, culture, sports, people, characters, and music, uh, most importantly. So it, it kind of followed the same suit, like you're, you're interested in, in, you know, bike racing or skateboarding and you saw all these videos and at least to me, like I would watch them all day, just like end to end and, um, and kind of pursuing racing, uh, more internationally racing, uh, you know, trying to like race world cups. I wasn't good enough. Like that was quite evident. There's kind it was easy to see. I couldn't keep up, and um, and I just kind of just randomly decided to pick up a camera. Like I thought to myself, like I can, I can do this. I had no idea what I was doing. Um, I had never filmed. I grew up with friends who would do like kind of like mock music videos. Like you know, they would do like the Beastie Boys skateboard videos, and had like they had a good style and good eye for for how things were made. So I kind of I kind of saw how they would do their things. Like if they can do it, I could do it, sort of thing. Um, and I just I just kind of I just picked up a camera and started traveling right right off the bat. I didn't film anything in my neighborhood. I just got a camera, went to the south of France, and stayed with my friends at that time, who were still Norwegian, um, and just follow them like when they were training and, and racing. And that really, that became just like, I just kind of threw myself into the fire, you know, to be honest, and, and filmed for, I guess, like three or four months and came back and just started editing that footage. So it's really naive, but also really intuitive, I would say. So what, what kind of um, films were you watching? Like I, I used to downhill mountain bike and I like the new world disorder. Do you remember those, that series? Yeah. And, and funnily enough, I, I shot with them and for them in the first film. And I think the second film as well. So I was, I was, I started out more or less in the same era and, uh, I haven't, I haven't spoken to, um, uh, I haven't spoken to them in years. <laughs> But they're still around. Um, but I met those guys. Uh, I think it was in Slovenia at the Maribor. Maribor is a city in Slovenia, and they, were, they had a World Cup there. And and I think that was kind of I think it was like my first or second year filming. So I would basically go to these races. But I didn't know enough people to kind of get a thing going. I would just I all I knew was racing. So I would just go to these races and shoot the race basically as 
you know, kind of like a documentary or, or like, um, like a video magazine, I was called back in the day. And I, I met those guys, uh, Derek uh, and Alex uh, Fosswit, that was the, the main DP at the time. And, um, and that kind of like became like a proof of concept because I saw how other people were doing it. You know, they're posting up along the, the, the race and filming all the, the, the quick, the fast racers. And, um, and it became just like a real stepping stone. You would just go from, you know, your friend who was like an amateur racer to, you know, maybe like a semi-pro, like a pro, and, and you would get enough kind of footage or, you know, enough to kind of piece together like a segment in a, in, in a video. And that became, you know, that became it basically. Then you had like a film or a video at the end of the year. So, um, so yeah, I mean, that's that's basically it. Quite quickly, I got into skiing as well, and and that was kind of where I where I hit my hit my kind of main kind of sweet spot when it came to these sports films uh, or these these ski films, because it was kind of the same scene, and 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 skiing and mountain biking at the time had certain similarities, and and some people would just do the biggest air or just like jump the biggest cliff, and that became their testament to you know their skill or their, you know, art, artistry or what do you want to call it? So, um, so yeah, I mean, it's, I think, I think the, the best thing about it for me was that it became a real film school and you could kind of, I mean, if you had enough interest, you could kind of figure out how things were made. So, you know, you could, you could edit, you can find music and you could, you could understand like how people would create like a segment, which, you know, it can either be something that had more like a comedic effect or more of a story, you know, it was more geared toward, you know, skateboard videos or what Spike Jones did, you know, and, and had like, had it was more like a gag or it could be this kind of epic, like view into someone's lifestyle, uh, which, you know, was more kind of, you know, mountain bike or motocross. It was more serious, but it had a lot of, I think it had a lot of heart. Uh, that's what I kind of, Know, got interested in um and you could also figure out how people were shooting so a lot of people did a lot with you know very kind of meager means um and there was a big divider at the time like either you were shooting like a small digital camera or you were shooting film and i got quickly into shooting film so i had like a bunch of 16 cameras and and just kind of followed that group of people and that became kind of like your you know your business card or whatever you could kind of see like who was doing it full on and maybe who wasn't at that time um and also because film was just so much better to shoot on as well so it it, it really it was really fun it was really like you would go out and try and just figure stuff out and come back watch the footage and just kind of okay this is how we're gonna do it next time um so did, what were you like the for early days? Like what were you editing on? It, it, I mean, it's similar to what Final Cut was and, and I guess also similar to what Premiere is today, but in its, um, there was, there was definitely Final Cut was early and, and there was another software that was similar to Final Cut. Um, I, I think, I think it was called edit, but it, it had the same timeline. It was really easy. I mean, the editing that we did back then and I guess like still today it's it's just like timeline based I mean there's no VFX or 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 things like that so it's just kind of linear editing but you could figure out there are certain videos that that were more edited that had more like a rhythmic sense um and you can kind of like pick up on that or you could try and tell a story um most people are just kind of edit to like the beat of the music so the segment would be however long this, the song was. And then some people would edit the song as well and maybe tailor it a bit more. So there was, you know, this kind of like endless like avenue of opportunities and you can find whatever it is that you liked and kind of latched onto that. And, uh, and I enjoyed both. Like I, I liked both editing and filming basically. So to me, it was all good. It was all fun. You started off filming like the mountain biking and then skiing and 
I guess like those kind of films, like the sports action films, it's like all about like the tricks and the location and like the music, like you're saying, like editing to the music. Like were you also filming like some B-roll of certain things or doing like voiceovers or how did you kind of progress to the next level of like storytelling within your filmmaking? Well, I think, I think to me, I was always, and I'm still am, still am, I'm just really curious and, and want to know about people and, and, and try and tell their story. Um, in those times it was more visual for sure. It wasn't, it wasn't a lot of story. It was, it wasn't a lot of voiceovers or, or interviews like that because that's not kind of what that market was geared towards. Some films were more kind of introvert, you know, more surf films. They had more of a, you know, I think they had more, you know, I think surfers in general were more kind of in tune with what they wanted to do and kind of skiers and mountain bikers, they were just kind of like going for it. So it became more about the tricks, but to me, it learned, I learned a lot about timing and being kind of in the right place at the right time. Um, figure out locations and figure out weather and, and just having that persistence and, and luck also just trying to figure out where to shoot because at that time we didn't have, you know, Google maps or, or anything to go on. We would just kind of get in a car, go get on a plane, fly somewhere and try and figure it out. And you would time it to what you thought would, would be the best part of the season, but it was a lot of hiking and digging and, and just kind of staying in touch with people. So I think, I think in that sense, like the world becomes really small. Like you just have to like, you just have to find it, uh, which I, I still enjoy. So today, like if you want to find good locations, you just have to go out and do it. You just have to go out and find it. Um, so yeah, it became, it became very kind of, um, tangible, I would say. In terms of like, uh, response because you didn't have youtube back then where you could just put it out and like listen to comments or like did you have screenings for these films where you kind of see the crowd and everyone reacts and they cheer for a certain like was that kind of your film school like you said like that's how you you gauge like interest and is this a successful film like maybe i should do less of those things and more of that like is that kind of how you progressed totally um and and by all means like some people are made you know they sold, you know, hundreds and thousands of copies of these films. And you had distributors that that sold it, you know, to shops or I guess like online a little later on. But uh, but you would also do these tours at the end of the season. So in, in the fall season, you would do tours that either you would organize yourself or someone would organize for you in different countries. And if you're lucky enough, people would screen your film. And it could be anything from, you know, 10 to like 15 people in a small shop to a couple of thousand in a, like a rock venue. And, um, and it was, it was really fun. Like that was just the way it was. Basically, we didn't really think of, I don't think it exists today in the same kind of style. Um, maybe there's like a once or twice a year, uh, but you know, 10, 15 years ago, everybody was doing it and you could kind of know like like the band was coming into town and in, if you're a kid and you had or you know whatever age you can go out and, and watch these films and um i don't think it it was like a career opportunity like you would see like oh okay this you know so and so like this is how we we did it you just kind of take take off that year you know, you're happy with what you did and you had, you know, good people around you and you just kind of move on to the next one. So how did, how did you like fund these projects? Were you just like bankrolling, like, especially the early ones, were you just kind of like hoping that this would go somewhere or like, were you investing your own money or finding sponsors? Like, how did you afford to do this as a, like a career? Yeah. Well, most people had sponsors, um, you know, I think I think some had quite decent sponsorship, and and then others had uh, whatever they could get. Um, but then also the riders or the athletes who paid pretty well at that time, some at least, so they had travel budget and and basically had to like devote their time to be a part of these films. So it's all kind of linked together. Everything was a big ball, 
you know, you had the industry supporting the athletes, you had the brands, uh, you know, that was kind of their main kind of PR thing um, for the year. You know, that's where their, the photos got created. So everything came together. If you were doing these shoots and you, and you would travel, you know, for a week or two weeks with someone, they would get a lot from that basically. So it still has, you know, making a commercial today, like, you know, agency client says, oh, we're going to do this film or this spot, but they also want, you know, the 60 cut downs or, or whatever. So you go there on a mission, you go there on a assignment, but there is a lot more stuff that's being created. So, so even though, you know, you, as a, you know, a producer or, or whatever you want to call it at the time, maybe you didn't have that much money on your own, uh, but you didn't need that much. So you need money to kind of pay for the film, get it telecined, and that was it basically. The rest was kind of, and then at the end of the year, you would kind of recuperate and, and make your, your money back basically. Kind of like Red Bull or something like Red Bull creates all their own stuff. Like, yeah, I mean, Red Bull, um, I mean, Red Bull is, is just an example of, I mean, I mean, they do so much though. Um, so it, it definitely, I think a lot of the stuff that everyone did before Red Bull became what Red Bull is doing today, I guess, if that makes sense. So, I mean, the, the market was kind of created by these core videos. Um, but I think, I think also maybe, you know, people don't know this, but the amount of effort that people made into these films, even in the seventies, they were shooting IMAX or eighties, they were shooting IMAX on, on sports, uh, documentaries. So it all, always has been a great interest in capturing people moving and also doing it in the best way possible. And before, you know, the Cineflex or the, the gimbal on the helicopter or the drone and people were doing like crazy cable cams, uh, you know, strapped into like a paraglider suit, you know, with a helmet and holding the 16 camera and shooting after people, you know, flying down the hill. And it has always been kind of, in a way, it's been like a testing pool for, for figuring out how to capture things. I mean, the GoPro is a testament to that. So, you know, the whole kind of art of movement, which, you know, in a way kind of trans transcended into YouTube, you know, people want to watch people move or, or, or fly or jump or things like that came from that scene, you know, came from those films and came from that type of lifestyle, basically. And then, you know, it kind of trickles down into a lot of uh, different other aspects. But but definitely Red Bull, in a sense, you know, capitalized on it. So how did you get from the action sports to going to commercials? Like, what was, was there like one kind of your first commercial or was there like a slow progression, like going from the sports and then commercials here and there? Or like, how did that kind of go? It, it was or still is, I guess, a slow progression. Um, but but coming from that scene, you know, dealing with all these athletes, traveling the globe, I guess, uh, working with all these brands, it 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 kind of it kind of gave me a chance to jump into working as a as a I guess like a creative and uh, for a lot of brands um so when i when i didn't do the films on a regular basis i would start working for brands basically i would do a lot of their films um so basically working with could be an agency that was working for a sports brand could be heli hansen could be red bull could be a swedish brand called peak performance could be oakley um and you just basically go on these shoots and uh and do films for them and uh, but it was more geared towards what they were doing more precisely so you get in on the brand side and so because you had a lot of knowledge about how to shoot and, and who to shoot and and kind of try and tell that story uh for them it that became kind of like the first commercial work so it it, it was kind of like a small bridge trying to like figure out like what's the next step and at that time uh 
you know, being a, a DOP or like being like a commercial director wasn't like, it wasn't on my radar. And I don't think you can make that switch uh, just overnight. Um, so it is, it is a slow burn. You have to figure out like what's the next step and also how the scene is. And, and it was still kind of like media was still kind of it in its infancy when it comes to like shooting digital, like the red cameras had just came out. And then like what kind of like runtime were those early films? Cause you, you probably didn't have like months to film it. Like, was it kind of like one or two days or over a week? And then they wanted like a one minute film or it was like a five minute thing. Like, and then where would it go? Where would it live? Like, cause there was no YouTube. Uh, was there YouTube back then? It, it just came out, I would say like, but, but brands at that time, they hadn't like figure out cause they had a lot of good footage. I mean, nowadays people say content, but they had a lot of good stuff but it wasn't like a real platform to use it. So it, it would run on a DVD and it would send it out to shops or it would send it out to, um, to big screens, things like that. And it could be anything. Um, and, um, but I remember like, cause we did a film for Heli Hansen. It was shot, we shot it on film and it was kind of this like early, like portrait film, um, that, that was capturing their, um, their kind of like brand language at the time. Like we had a small script which is quite funny. And we shot this character portrait of, of these four people. Um, and I think it was like, a, I think it was a factory worker and a, and a pro skier and a snowboarder and this um, rescue boat captain. And it, it was to like today, it would be like a brand branded content film and it would go up on the brand's website, like in an instant. But, but when it came out, I remember because I had a friend who was doing commercials at the time, he was a director and he's like, oh, that's a great film. Like now this, you could do something with it, but there wasn't really like an outlet where you could show it to, like, it wasn't like a TV commercial or, or anything like that. But I kind of saw like where we, we could take this because we had a, a way of getting to these kind of stories or these scripts because, you know, we were getting them pretty easy. Um, so it was, it was more or less just kind of chipping away of, off of that basically and trying to learn um, as much as possible. I was fortunate enough to being offered a few jobs basically. And, and it was a few, it was kind of at a, at a glance, it was, it was this, uh, these kind of portrait films uh, for a brand. Um, and it was usually, it would usually be like a one subject, one story, for instance. Um, we did a film about a climber and we did a film about a photographer, a nature photographer. And, and those two films, I would say like relaunched or like launched my career in some capacity, but you know, they weren't big films. They weren't big kind of commercial spots, but they came at a time where I had, I'd gotten together with a group of people and we we're kind of in the same kind of mindset. Like we, we want to tell these stories or we think this is the way of doing it. And a lot of it came back to the skills that we had from early days. Like you could get a camera, you get a crew and you can just go out and shoot something. And um, I think like the persistence of figuring things out, you would understand like how to find locations. You had enough skill to, tie, to, tell, to tell a story um, and you would work with some really good you know, DPs, uh, you could, you could make a two minute film or three minute film or however long you wanted to make it, but you can go out and shoot something. And this time it was for a commercial client. Um, so I think once that ball started rolling, um, it was kind of just like surfing that wave and, and trying to find those projects. And in terms of like finding characters or judging people, like you, I'm sure you, through your early years of traveling with professional mountain bikers or skiers, or you could kind of see this level of professionalism and you kind of see who succeeds and who doesn't. So was that, do you think, part of like you finding the story, maybe, you know, these little character traits that you kind of gravitate towards and you think that that would be a story worth telling? Yeah, I think so. I think that's one of my 
I wouldn't say my, it's, it's not a favorite thing, but it's definitely, it's definitely something I look for and, and, and did look for, like I, I got to experience that you would kind of see my greatest kind of interest is, is being watching someone succeed or watching someone attempt something like I've, I've always enjoyed that. And also the process of, of helping someone and, and just kind of living through their eyes and, and, and watching this. And, and to me, like I would capture that with the camera. I thought that was always incredibly interesting and, and really, really fun. But you can also just see like the mindset of people, uh, which I think correlates. I mean, it's all the same, like an athlete that's attempting of winning something. Someone has it, someone unfortunately doesn't. Could be on that day, could be overall. And, and you would kind of see, it's not a pattern, but you could recognize some of the traits you know, who had talent, but also like who worked the hardest and, and who would uh, who would try something they, they didn't, you know, think they could do things like that. And, you know, it, it's good or for worse. It doesn't really matter, but it, it, it became just a kind of like a character study. Uh, and I've, you know, I've been fortunate to, to meeting a lot of different people. Um, not just athletes or it could be also adventurers or climbers or or people who really kind of give themselves to you know their craft or their their uh, their passion i would say so and you kind of pick up on that and i could i could feel i could i could use that again for this this little piece for gore-tex like you could kind of see like who would fit in camera or in this story or how they would would kind of you know, be in this film or this uh, this attempt that they were doing. So I think uh, I think that's something that I have always had as an interest, but also gained a lot of experience with uh, over time. Um, and it's really, really fun. Yeah, because I think a lot of uh, like reality shows go wrong when they try to like manufacture the drama or they try to put people in a certain situation what they're not comfortable with like whereas if you're like the best directors kind of create an environment for the actors to act rather than trying to trick them into things or to try and make it like yeah like the the structure trying to make this at the point like trying to, too much science behind it so that's the kind of the best kind of documentaries where they just let it happen but a lot of the times like the producer or whatever doesn't have enough time to just <laughs> film for three years but especially on a, a documentary but if you have like a a path like a, a task where they have to kind of complete i think that's good to like see their their struggle and and like that um the documentary um with uh, the alex guy the climber the free solo one have you seen that yeah that's kind of got, got all those pieces in there and it's like oh my god <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, it's interesting and it's, it's really fun trying to figure out and obviously like you would read a book or maybe you listen to music or you watch a film and, and a lot of people think like, you know, can I do Could I do this? Like, is this for me or is this, you know, is this how they did it? And then you try and emulate that. And to me, like filmmaking has always been very intuitive and 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 because I, I don't, you know, I, I, I do what I do is is I try to put as much things I can in front of the camera and and I really want to try and, and go somewhere with someone and try and kind of create that moment. After you did that Gore-Tex commercial did you get like a lot of um, praise from whoever you did it for like did they say good job like here's another project or like how did you get was it Reebok was the next one like what was after that? I did this uh, spot for a for a for a I guess it's like a phone company in Scandinavia, um, and uh, and we followed this uh, photographer. It's nature photographer. So basically, they wanted to do all these kind of character films. You know, we're you know maybe more on the branded content side now, short stories and um, and um, we followed this photographer, this nature photographer. I, I would say this is in the when kind of Instagram was hitting off and and you would have now everybody has you know hundreds and thousands of followers but at that time this guy from Norway was doing 
kind of these these crazy travel photos. He, he was basically putting himself in what I would say like was in harm's way. He would he would stand off like the edge of these crazy waterfalls and and doing some exposed hikes. And that was kind of his his deal. And he became someone that people would would uh, would look to for these kind of you know holy shit moments basically and so we did a film a short film with him is that called the adventurist Taylor? yeah that was yeah. called the adventurist and i think i think that was i mean it's it's still like a to me it was kind of like a baffling experience because we only i think we only scouted for like half a day and then we shot it all in one go and we're six or seven people making this film there's no agency on the shoot there's no client on the shoot there is agency and client involved in the project but you know it's they just kind of let us go and and we're totally fine with that um there was this really great online uh image site that i think google bought and then they kind of shelved it and it was it was basically like google images the way google images are is today is kind of rubbish and and uh this site that i can't remember what it's called the site that that existed six seven years ago you could you could go on every little kind of detail it was it was like a gps accuracy was dead on so if you saw a photo of a waterfall that was basically where it was nowadays it's kind of like while it's in this kind of you know terrain but it we're not going to give you like the full <laughs> like the the detailed dps location of it so we could i could basically scout a huge portion of terrain and kind of figure out like where we wanted to shoot this guy and this guy was living in in a western side of norway and he was a he was a phenomenal character still is like he's an incredible person um so we basically you know landed um uh, in his town and shot this spot in, in I think like three days. Um, and just had like an incredible amount of locations that we managed to tick off. And it's, it's still like, it's, it's just like a visual kind of portrait, which is fine. But, but like the terrain that we went to was super exposed in some places and incredible weather and texture and colors and, and just a lot of stuff happening all the time. And, um, I think if if you would put that into like a commercial production, it would be a huge event uh, now. If you want to say, this is exactly how we want it to look, like it has to look authentic. We have to get this kind of grittiness. We have to get this guy, look, we have to get the right guy or girl um, to be this character. It would just take, you know, so much more money and time. And we kind of just go went out and did it. And, um, and that was really fun. Like it's, it was super fun. How did you get the shot of like the POV of him looking over the waterfall and you can see his shoe? Did he hold the camera? Yes, um, exactly. So we basically <laughs> strapped, uh, strapped the camera to his, his chest and then he walked, you know, uh, out and onto the cliff. So you, you did the, the adventurist and then you did a few more like in the same kind of style following around like rock climbers or photographers or different sports people and um i'm not sure when it happened but like then you did one with hugh jackman like what was that like like because he's a an actor like how did you get him to you know go up a mountain like convince him that you know what you're doing and he's going to be i guess there's producers involved and like how did that whole thing come about i mean in in essence it's a lot that shoot there it's a lot like the adventurist so you have the guy in Norway that's a photographer moving around in the mountains and then all of a sudden like we're fast forwarding we're in Colorado we're in Telluride with with Hugh Jackman and um, and it's a different scene but it's it's kind of the same approach although the shoots you know I don't know 20 or 30 times bigger and and there's a lot of logistics um, first of all the crew there producers everyone agency they're the best. They're so generous. Everyone's so on it, and um, and it's it's done really for the right reasons, I would say. So that's 
one one thing. Like we want to chase something that's authentic. Um, we're allowed to scout for for a good portion of time. There's a lot of uh, means being available. We have heli rides. Uh, we have good guides there, and we can explore the terrain and kind of map out all the options basically. So basically, when we're heading into production, we have ten days of prep. We've scouted for seven days. Uh, weather's still looking good. Like we're at the tail end of fall. Like it's not a lot of time until winter sets in, and it, it's kind of like on the limit because Colorado Telluride, it's forty thousand feet. Like we're up on elevation. Like weather can change uh, in an instant, and we have this the Hollywood star coming in and he has a day, not even like five hours to shoot, you know, how are we going to put that together? Um, but I think, I think it's just about kind of making everything kind of tangible, making it smaller. Again, it's, it's fairly similar. Like we're observing a character. He's making a journey. Uh, there's a script, there's a VO, um, there's there's things that we know we need to shoot to kind of be able to piece this together. Um, if weather comes in and we're not able to fly on the day of the shoot, then that's bad because then we won't get any shots. Then it's all kind of low elevation. Um, so I think it's just about you know being prepared. But then even if you have you know more support and more crew, you have to figure out like how to kind of manage um the day of the shoot so we have a few days where we're shooting b-roll we're getting some stuff but when jackman comes in like everything needs to be coordinated and um I'm, I'm a big fan of coordination and and that's what i've done in in a lot of other commercials uh prior but also after um so when you know you're in a pocket basically we're in this space then it's about mapping out the most logical way of doing things. And then you want to just hit that mark as much as possible. Um, and then basically, what I said before, like, if you then can pick up the camera or help someone and you can move faster and you can get there faster and you can be more efficient and you can do more stuff. And, and that's basically how that shoot came about. It's just about using all the research, like we're, you know, read topography maps, climbing books, finding all the angles and, and, and scouting so much unnecessary locations that we didn't end up using. Uh, but on the day of the shoot, like we knew basically we had gone through it all. Um, and we did some big changes the night before because we had basically the beta. Like we knew that we're in a position of not guessing, like we were pretty sure that if we went to these spots instead, we could shoot more on the day, basically. And did you do like a rehearsal, like with maybe like a stand-in, like the whole bedroom scene, like to get the lighting right and like get everything? Because you know you're limited time, so you're like, all right, I know we're going to get this shot, this shot. Like, did you frame it all out and then have when Hugh came, you could kind of knock it all out? Like, was like you said, being prepared. There wasn't any like trying to figure it out on the day. Yeah, exactly, and I think. I, again, you can approach this with, with different tools. Uh, I mean, you, you do storyboards, you do all the location photos, you do all the stand-ins. And then if, if, you're, if you're really in sync, then you do your pre-lighting. Even though if you're not shooting in a studio, um, here we're moving, we, I think we have three helicopters in the air at the same time. We're 25 people crew or something like this. So not everyone can fit into the helis uh, at once. I think we're all flying. I think we're four people, four people in each heli ride. So it's all kind of a circular kind of um, drop off. Um, but at the end of the day, we are shooting this cabin basically. So we need everybody to be down at the same time. Um, so everything needs to be pre-lit basically. So, but once that's done, it's it's quick, like it's efficient. And and I have to say, like working with someone like Jackman on this shoot, like he's he's so lovely, so awesome. I think he enjoys it. Uh he's being out, like he's riding helis, he's climbing, you know, he's being kind of like thrown into this. 
Um, but he's super generous about it. Like there's no, you know, he doesn't need anything basically. We just take him by the hand and, and go. And, um, and that's the fun part. Like you can then do a lot of things. Like if you have a lot of limit limitations, you need to plan for it. But on this shoot, like we plan to have a lot of freedom, like we could move. And that's basically what we did. What about like the voiceover? Do you record that on the day or do you just wait another time? Or like, how do you get that? The voiceover is recorded uh, afterwards, basically. And, uh, and um, yeah, he, at that, at that time, like he sent us a bunch of takes. So, and that was totally fine. He would, he would get the script and he would spend an hour reading and we would pick, pick the, the best bits. So yeah, that was no problem at all, basically. After you did that one um, with Hugh Jackman, you did a few more and then um, I'm not sure of the timeline, but you, there's one you did Vodafone be ahead with the skier. Like I'm sure that kind of brought everything that you kind of enjoy doing, like the skiing and like the, the kind of, you know, montage of building up the showing his, like the underdog, like the whole, you know, Rocky kind of sequence of training and getting ready for the, the payoff and then the celebration. Was that kind of something that you really enjoyed to do? Yeah, really. It's it's definitely one of my favorite experiences. And and I, I, I say again, like it's more to me, it's it's more about the experience than the film, uh, which sounds kind of cheesy, but um, but it was an incredible experience. And also because that film really came from nothing. Uh, it, it was a different script in the beginning. It still had the same kind of gist, like they wanted to show this ski jumper, but the idea was, was mainly to use stock footage as more of the storyline or the way uh, the film was going to develop. And it was like a 30 second spot, basically. So I think we're lucky because at that time, the you know, producers, production company, uh, myself, like we felt we could do something with this, like there was something we could shoot and just kind of started like chipping away off of that idea. Um, incredible agency, Jung Vermont, like they're so nice uh, too in this process because they want to do something too with it. Like there is something we can make of this story if we if there's a chance and the chance here basically becomes the locations. So before the job is kind of settled or awarded or, or you know, everything's done, we're out there scouting. Like we're doing, we're assessing like all the options basically. Where can we shoot this? And, and from there, kind of the idea kind of develops. And it's similar to like the shoot with, with Jackman. Like if you have a great location, if you're in the right kind of pocket, then you know you can do a lot more. Like if that cabin wasn't placed in, down at the bottom of that valley we, we could have never done that shot because it becomes just logical like you can't travel from a to z in that time space basically so a lot of the stuff that i approach is kind of like that like you look at what's available and then you kind of go from there and and a lot of it has to do with locations because if you're shooting a feature or a documentary you have the luxury of time or not but you know, less so in commercials because you know you're only given a day or two or three, you know, maybe you you make a deal and you get a half a day, you know, with a small team basically. But for Vodafone, we saw the potential in locations. And, and from there, we could kind of see like a storyline being available to us because the, the essence of the character is still the same. Like the, the essence of the character was in the script it wasn't but it wasn't just it wasn't planned to be shot basically um so when we're being offered you know locations you know it could be in austria it could be in switzerland then it's slovenia and it's france Gora, uh, then you know kind of like okay well this looks great like this looks really cool and you kind of step into like i always go right into like google maps and just kind of see what's around you know here's the ski jump it's in this valley here's a small town here's cabins here's roads and then and you can kind of like okay well maybe that's doable like maybe there's something we can kind of you know make of this basically um 
And because we had a little bit more time, we could write a script. So basically we wrote a script with the agency, the kind of a new script uh, or treatment and, um, and offered that to the client basically and said, well, we know you want this idea and you're gonna get this idea. That's basically what we're saying, but we're gonna develop it a little bit more. And, and the only change here I would say is that we knew we could do it because we had all the locations scouted. Uh, so we knew we could shoot this in two days and then we were offered three days and then we said well you know maybe we'll do some test scenes on the first half a day so basically we end up like with three and a half days so you can always like push a little bit if, it, if it's available to you and you're not you know breaking people's backs or blowing the budget or things like that i see the the dp is paul myers what was it like working with him paul is an incredible dp He's a force of nature and he's just so skilled, but to me, more so than that, he's just so into what he's doing and he's so passionate about it. So when I, when I have the first call with him, you know, I, I love his work. I know everything is done. Um, what, what, what I don't realize is just how into it he is. Like I've, I've worked with a lot of DPs. And, and still do like that are the same, like just like to shoot and they're, they, they don't stand around like they're always um, active. But he's, he's more than that. Like he's, he's grading footage in the hotel room, you know, after a day, day of work. Um, he has input on everything basically. And, and, you know, a lot of DPs are the same, but but to me it was just a totally new experience beyond what I was used to. Um, yeah, he was he, he was just very he was so sure of what he was doing and and so into it. And I think what's really fun to when you're collaborating with people and can be anyone, uh, DPs or or composers, whatever is that you can take something it doesn't need it scale has nothing to do with it budget has nothing to do with it it can be all sometimes you need a camera sometimes you need something more but it doesn't really matter what it is like it is basically what you need at this very moment and uh, and working with paul is is like that like we can create some incredible moments we can be incredibly quick about it because that's also what we like to do like we want we want to get variety basically so we need to be quick so we can scout, we can talk about it, but when we're shooting, like we're really quick about it and, and it becomes this kind of puzzle basically. And you're in that zone for like three days, you're in this kind of tunnel, like it's basically just like running shoes on and, and you just kind of go with it. And, um, I, yeah, it's really, really fun. It's really inspiring. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that happens quick and it, it's, it comes out beautiful. And it also feels experience is really inspiring as well. And then in terms of like on the shoot, in terms of lighting, like do you, did he kind of light the, the scene and then kind of just set it or is each shot kind of relit and like you're kind of having to wait around for the lighting to change or do you want to like add more like haze or like do you need to get that snow in, like that kind of thing, like there's a lot of like multiple takes like like how long do you spend on a, like a scene because you know the clock's ticking and like that kind of thing props to paul and and his skill but but he is incredibly efficient and also that type of lighting that what, we're, what we know we like and we're looking for and also is manageable with the means we have i mean you we pick the locations that, are, that have you know what we need what we think is going to be the most beautiful option for us um and it, once it's set, it's set. Like it's it's not a lot of um, changing and things not working. Uh, also because in in that spot there, like we're shooting a lot of scenes. Like we want to get variety, so we don't need to linger on on stuff. Like we'll set a scene, we'll do a couple of takes, we'll do some variation, maybe we'll move in for for a close up or something that's uh, needed. Um, but it's not uh, we're not lingering too much, basically. So. We know what we need, what we want, and we're not exploring too much either. And also, the the client we have on set, they're so chill about it, and they're really into it. And I think sometimes when you work fast and you get a lot of stuff, like people 
respect that and they also just want to let you go without kind of you know reassessing like every take and and kind of you know you know sometimes it's it's difficult to to kind of you know tell people that you know we're going to edit this we're just looking for this moment don't worry about what's happening in the beginning of the take or the end like we just want to get this section and and this is take number 12 like it's not better than take number seven like trust us um it depends on what you're shooting as well like if you're shooting a lot then sometimes it might be easier to just kind of keep shooting because people enjoy that basically things are moving because nobody wants to like spend too much time on on a scene so um so yeah you know it's it's moving quickly and uh yeah, it becomes like a dance yeah what, what was after like vodafone did you do any um projects after that it's 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 been a lot of same, similar type of projects i would say um a lot of character and and story and and um and type of type of similar type of scripts um and also these kind of more epic like adventure shoots um shot in saudi for for neom and going into the desert and and being kind of in really exposed kind of terrain um and and going again like using the same kind of tools to just like figure out like what it is we can do you know that's for one like we have the script like we know what, what we need to shoot but it becomes also this kind of like vision quest like um it's not cold but it's hot and it's not steep but it's far away like we need to to find ourselves in these kind of pockets and explore and which is really fun like it's i really like doing these uh, more scripted like character uh, storyline uh, ideas and commercials I, I love to write from character point of view and i always try and and, and feed that into the story even if it's not on screen um just to figure out like what it is we need to say and how the character needs to move and and how how that can fit into the script but then sometimes it's just pure visual like you just need to go with the camera and go with the right people and and go on this big track which um, was this shoot we did for for neom and i really love doing that as well um it, it's kind of similar to uh these uh first kind of few sports films that, that i or was a part of so it's equal measure like you want to explore kind of nature and you want to explore kind of like humanity um and I, I still uh, I still love doing that that's really fun um as much as I can like you want to shoot like in camera and you want to you want to be there for the sunrise or the sunset or with the person and, and try and just kind of figure it out and and um yeah it's it's really fun do you have any like plans for the future or like things that you want to accomplish? Everyone's different, I guess. I mean, if you want to do feature films, you want to do documentaries. I, I do really want to do more long form and more story, whether that's documentary or feature-ish. Uh, I don't know. Um, I'm I'm really uh, fortunate to be working with good people and, and, and seeing a lot of work that's being created now. I'm still very open to what it is that we can find because a lot of the stuff that i've been involved in so far some of them have come from really kind of small kind of ideas um vodafone for one and another like them uh, and trying to just kind of make that idea grow if you're able to and and keeping that kind of mind open um i think there's uh I think there's still a, a, a huge need for like storytelling and, and bringing value and purpose into, you know, the commodity of like commercial filmmaking and, 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 um, and seeing, you know, a lot of like the value being into like streaming now and documentaries and, and kind of how that is received like publicly, like people want to watch stories. They want to watch people tell their stories or want to be in that kind of narrative. Uh, there's still a lot to do also in, in the commercial space and kind of like finding that bridge where it's not just a TVC. It can be something that has uh, more legs to stand on. Maybe it's a longer project. Um, yeah, I think there's a huge opportunity to to kind of create those values that, that last, you know, 
beyond uh, you know beyond a set period of time basically been great hearing your story and like seeing how you started doing like action sports and building your way up continuing like the same kind of like storyline in terms of creating these small um, intimate stories about character driven pieces do you have any advice for like other filmmakers like wanting to do something similar to what you've done and and how can they go about it well i think i think the most important thing is to figure out what you, what you like basically and i think nowadays you know anything's possible and i know people are kind of tired of hearing that you know everything's you have all the tools you can make anything with your phone or with a friend as a camera um, but i think i think you need to be kind of open to an experience but you also need to be in an environment that you feel comfortable in sometimes you can inject yourself into that environment like if you want to chase a story uh you have to go to a certain place you have to do uh, a music documentary i mean one of my I mean, there's lots of good documentaries, but I, I just remember watching a documentary called Dig, if anyone's seen that, about Danny Warhols and Brian Jones and Massacre, two bands from Portland, or I think Portland, yeah. Um, and you have this young director uh, being kind of tasked with telling the, that story of those two bands, rap rising, basically. And um, it turns out into this amazing music documentary called Dig. And I think it took her, um, her name's Ani Timoner, a uh, female director. I think she made it over the course of like seven to eight years. And she would just shoot and shoot like constantly. She would basically, you know, I guess like their life became her life at a certain stage. But in the first moments of the film, you can hear her kind of going up to the band, introducing herself that was her kind of assignment for the day i guess you know a two-week job of creating this portrait and you can kind of hear, hear her kind of introducing herself to the band talking in the parking lot after a show and and you can kind of like sense like the the way like someone approaches the subject and just kind of you know jumps into scene basically i know there's a million stories out there to be told and like documentaries are a great way to kind of create a story and get used to filmmaking and kind of experiment. Um, and then like the hardest thing is like the access. So it's like, how do you get access to these people? And, you know, like you said, that initial introduction, like you got to have the right, you know, you know, the right things to say in terms of like, they don't want to be taken advantage of, like, like people are always kind of skeptical about, you know, are you trying to sell something, off, make money off us? like. So I think there's probably something to that in terms of like, you know, when you first started filming your ski ski films or mountain bike things, you were already in that kind of world and you know, you knew those people and, and that's kind of, you know, starting off rather than being an outsider coming into the world, it's a bit harder. I'm sure everyone's, you know, experience is, is of course different. I mean, I I definitely saw that it was once you're in an environment it was easy to kind of find other people right so if and and sometimes like i guess it's the same with if you do feature films like you you start out with a certain actor but then you want to try and get a different actor uh next time and it's about the script and it's about what you can do as a director or a filmmaker and it's all just you know just building a building and kind of chipping away or or creating something and then eventually, hopefully, you'll, like you'll have the means that you need or that you wish for. Um, so yeah, I mean, but but again, like you know, you kind of have to know a little bit of what it is that you want to do, and then you have to feel that you can do it. And to me, that's super important. Like I, I need to feel that I have a purpose <laughs> with what I'm doing, and that I can do it. And then um, and then you kind of kind of fill in the blanks, I guess, like you, you, it's, it's sometimes it's very time consuming. Um, and sometimes you don't do much maybe for a little bit of a period of time, like you, has, you haven't done anything that maybe you're happy with, but then you kind of have to look back at what it is you've, you've done and, uh, and move on from there. Um, 
I think and the most he, important thing to me, I was going to say just this, don't rush it. Like, don't rush it. Don't feel the need to do everything uh, in a couple of years. Just, like, let time kind of do its thing and um, and just kind of have that slow burn. That Because it is nice to kind of spend time just getting good at something. And then in terms of like you've you've done a documentary, you've done music videos, you got a little bit of work under your belt. How do you take it to the next level in terms of like making money, getting a like agent, like making it more of a career than a I guess a hobby? Um well I think I mean sometimes like if you're ha- if you're lucky enough, like the work speaks for itself. Like you'll you'll do something good that people kind of resonate with and think is good and then you'll you'll get another shot basically and uh that can happen quickly for someone um it gets picked up like maybe if if you're doing ads like it can go fairly quickly like they want the look or they want the style or or you you're doing something that gets a lot of attention it's great same thing with music videos you know it can be even more happenstance because then all you also um you're in partnership with the with the artist as well. Like if the artist is popular, but but then you're kind of piggybacking off of what they're doing. DP director relationship can be the same thing. Like you're always traveling with someone, and hopefully, you know, sometimes like one person does something good, and then ten will follow suit. And it's also that community sense. Um, so. Well, when it comes to like the the like the the making a work or making a living off of it, I mean, you can you can make a living off of doing anything basically um, nowadays, and and also before, and getting like an agent or getting someone to kind of vouch for you or or sell you or or help you, I mean, that's also you know you just have to kind of reach out to people and and give it a go, and sometimes. Um, you get someone that really wants to help you like they'll actually pick up the phone or answer your email and that's not that often so you have to really cherish the people that do i think that's that's you have to take care of the people that help you and that you surround yourself with um because there's a lot of talent out there and there's a lot of people who are busy and and all that those things but i think in general people just want to make good things and they want to do it with great people so yeah just take your time and and kind of figure out your bearings and and your surroundings and reach out to people and be nice and uh and yeah and just kind of go from there you know so uh, that's well. yeah that's what i do as well like also when people you know if they want my advice on something if you want to chat with me or, or call me or email me, like I'll, I'll always answer you know i think <clears throat> filmmaking sometimes it's it's kind of like a hidden society in for some and it's it's not really like it's no magic to it like it's everyone does the same thing more or less so i think the more you can kind of share the advice or your experience the better like everyone's going to learn from it well yeah thanks so much henrik like i'm sure people will learn a lot from today and it's very generous of you to give you give us your time and um, i really appreciate it awesome thanks rory thanks for having me